So, good morning, everybody, uh, to our uh, talk, GrassJS in the Sky. GrassJS is a high-performance remote sensing toolbox. I'm Markus Neteler, uh, part of the Grass uh, development team, together with Moritz Lennart and Markus Metz. We are presenting here latest and greatest uh, with the focus on remote sensing. Uh, Grass is an OSGEO project, by the way, exactly today, is the 12th birthday of uh, OSGEO, in case you didn't know. So um, 12 years ago, we founded OSGEO in Chicago on a, over a long weekend, and then it all evolved in what you know with more than 30,000 uh, unique subscribed people in the various mailing lists and conferences every month somewhere in the world. Well, so here we focus on, on Grass GIS. In this uh, very first slide, I just want to show uh, the last uh, roughly 35 years in one slide. Uh, you can imagine that the history is tremendous and uh, grass has come a long way, developed since 1984, uh, since 99 under a GNU GPL license available. And uh, yeah, we try to renew the project uh, continuously. And of course, it's an open uh, development community. What you can see here, uh, all the various links to different software packages. Um, I don't want to mention them all. Um, since uh, Grass 7.2 there, or 7.0 basically, 7.2 there is uh, time series processing, uh, raster, vector, and volumetric uh, data available. And you can do a lot of things like uh, uh, also looking at time series, even reconstruct them and so forth. Uh, this is a graphical user interface. You can process LiDAR data. You can process 3D water flow. Also in the morning, we had something about this. Uh, and naturally, uh, vector topological vector processing engine is there. And um, we have uh, also uh, Dockerfile, if you are on Docker, for example. We are using an HPC, and we will see something more about it later on. Just to tell you, Grass comes naturally with a Python interface. Uh, this Python interface has been simplified recently, something called Grass Session. You can use just to initiate your uh, session, which means in a few lines, like uh, with Grass Session and so on, you can uh, create it and then you can just go ahead and do your analysis. So nothing complicated and like other software projects, uh, you can go through, load your data set. Uh, it is internally using, uh, as before, the GrassJS database. But if you work like this, you do not really have to um, think too much about it. What you do have to know is, of course, what the projection is and other stuff like that. But uh, the ses session manager is doing it all for you. Um, recently, which means a few days ago, we published uh, Grass 4.7, 4.7.0, actually, which means, uh, sorry, <laughs> 7.4, of course. <laughs> Okay, so many numbers. 7.4, thank you. Um, it comes with a lot of features, which I cannot list here. Uh, there's the web page uh, up there. You can check uh, the presentation has been uploaded just to highlight a few things in case um, you are already using GrassJS. This is an example here, processing Sentinel data. Um, in terms of uh, wildfire, this is a wildfire somewhere in Australia. You see the RGB composite there. Uh, which is basically sh uh, uh, showing smoke, and there you can see more or less where it is uh, burning. This is a feature of Sentinel, of course, but you have all the possibilities to process multispectral data here. Um, you can, if you start Grass, if you are new to it, you can now uh, just download a demo data set, uh, one we are using for a long time. This you can, with a click, download, and then go through all the examples in the manual. Um, we have been working on auto-rectification. It used to be in Grass 6, and it took us a few years to bring it uh, also to Grass 7 because of different updated concepts there, so that's back. Um, R in GDAL, R external, uh, are the possibilities to, um, to use or even just register uh, data in a, in a Grass database. Register means you just tell it where uh, the original GeoTIFF or whatever file is, and then you can use it in the session itself. So no uh, need to duplicate data. Uh, we fix some handling um, with data which exceed the 90, uh, 90, 180, 180 degree definition, which happens with global data, 
which is quite ex essential if you work with such data. Um, by the way, uh, Cloud Optimized Geotiff you can also read because it is based on GDAL, so that's fairly easy. Um, export improved, uh, clipping for vector data made easy, and then tons of other fixes uh, which are there. Just to now drive you more uh, to the topic here, um, which means um, remote sensing. Uh, we have been adding more, uh, at more satellites uh, to the atmospheric correction. It is based on 6S. 6S is also used elsewhere, like in ArcC, for example. Um, and we have been adding uh, a tool in order to process MODIS uh, satellite data more easily. MODIS satellite data come with uh, additional layers of quality, so in each pixel you get an information what the quality is. That is extremely useful, but it can be a tricky, bit tricky to process these bit patterns, and so you have a tool here um, which is helping you with that. So, um, I switch to Moritz, who will now present on remote sensing and grass GIS um, a long history. So just go ahead, have a seat if you want to come in. So yes, as uh, Marcus said, uh, we're kind of zooming in now into the main topic, which is remote sensing. Before then, Marcus Metz goes on to show you the example of how to do this in a high performance computing environment. So GRASS GIS as such has a very long history, and the remote sensing in GRASS GIS is almost just as long in terms of history. You already had first sub-modules available in 1986 for GRASS 1.1, and then from GRASS 3.0 in 1988, you had a whole suite of modules integrated into the core grass, which are the I dot something modules, uh, so the whole imagery family. Ever since, we've had steady improvements and additions uh, really constantly. There's been constant evolution also following, obviously, the changes in types of satellite data that we can use. And we've moved from what you can see at the top, very simple text-based uh, console in the 1980s to uh, a much more complex and modern GUI uh, system to handle all that data. What is quite important, I think, to understand also, and somewhat of a product also of the long history of, of GRASS and the fact that when GRASS was written at the beginning, computers did not have the same capacities as they do now. A lot of the GRASS internal libraries and uh, GRASS modules are very memory efficient. So you can work with a lot of very heavy, heavy data, and, and we'll, we'll go back to that in the high-performance computing. So what can you do in terms of remote sensing with GRASS? And kind of the, the motivation for this talk also came from a, a colleague who one day told me, oh, I've known about GRASS-GIS for a long time, but I thought it was a GIS and didn't even know it can do any remote sensing. So uh, here's an overview of uh, a series of pixel-based techniques that, that, that we have from pre-processing, where you can do uh, atmospheric correction, pan sharpening, a uh, whole series of, of, of different techniques, um, to uh, you have transformation, uh, very different uh, modules that allow you to do uh, principal component analysis, uh, wavelet transformations. You can calculate a whole series of indices, vegetation indices. You have edge detection modules. Um, so a whole series of, of transformation possibilities and, and, and uh, indexes you can create. You have a whole classification, pixel-based classification suite, where you can do maximum likelihood, but also uh, the ISMAP module, which is probably one of the first, let's say, hierarchical segmentation-based uh, 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 classification modules, even though it, the output is pixels. Uh, it is based on, on very different uh, levels of hierarchical uh, segmentation. Uh, you have access to modern machine learning um, techniques where we normally don't kind of develop them, uh, redevelop the wheel in, in GRASS, but we use outside tools, either SciPy or, or, or R uh, tools that exist. Um, we also have a, a whole host of specialized modules which look at specific topics. So there's a whole uh, suite of modules looking at evapotranspiration. You have energy balance uh, modules that use satellite uh, data to, to calculate energy balance information, biomass. We have a, a module that, that, that works on gravity measures, um, even one which uses data 
uh, from a moon mission, so you can do uh, so even extraterrestrial uh, uh, planetary science uh, can be done with, with GRASS. Um, so a whole series of modules uh, available and pixel-based. Maybe just as an addition to say that there's obviously a series of, let's say, generic raster tools, which are very useful for remote sensing as well. So we do have a, a, a map calculator as well, uh, which, which allows a very, very uh, wide range of operations. Um, there's, uh, as Marcus said, time series management, um, and, and you can do a whole series of, 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 of types of analysis of these time series. So um, these are all available. The second part, which is, let's say, more recent, is the object-based image analysis techniques that have been developed, um, also known as OBIA. Um, we've developed a, a, a module uh, which does segmentation, so which divides your uh, image into objects. And there's a whole tool chain that has been developed to go from the, the automatic, uh, let's say, segmentation parameter uh, op optimization all the way to machine learning based classification of the, the resulting objects. Um, so you now have the full pipeline available in GRASS um, with wherever possible the idea to, to, to parallelize and so to, to make it uh, possible to work on very, very large images uh, uh, in this pipeline. Uh, very recently as well, there was the creation of a uh, super <laughs> module to create uh, super pixels, which has been kind of a fashion in the last years as well, which then allows you to, to kind of reduce the complexity of an image by, by grouping pixels uh, in a certain way as well. And we're not stopping. So um, many more elements are being constantly developed. There's a whole suite of LiDAR tools as well that allows you to import LiDAR, to treat li LiDAR. Uh, Mark has already mentioned the, the suite for the creation of orthophotos. Um, and there's current developments going on um, we have uh, several students working on uh, neural networks and integration of neural network techniques into uh, GRASS currently. Um, there's work going on on trying to create what we call semantical cut lines, uh, which is very helpful when you do tiling um, in order to be able to parallel process your images. One of the problems when you use classical uh, straight lines is that you have edge effects. So what we're trying to create is cut lines that allow you to go through the image and, and cut your tiles irregular tiles um, according to, let's say, uh, uh, characteristics of the image where you say this is a good place to cut, you know, a long road or, th or things like that. Um, there's a whole host of extensions. So we've, in a, a few years ago, um, especially with the Python API evolving, um, there's been uh, uh, more and more extensions being created by researchers all over the world by, by um, contributors, and there's a whole host of, of extensions in remote sensing as well being created <coughs> constantly. Uh, and there's permanent work on ongoing trying to obviously increase the performance. Uh, we, we had the debate uh, not too long ago because we reached some issues where we got above uh, 2 billion uh, objects being created in, in, in segmentation, so with really, really large images. And so these are issues that we are faced with now that we're trying to work with. So um, I will give the floor now to Marcus Metz, who will give you an example of high-performance commuting with graphs. I will continue to provide an example how to use GRASS with uh, high-performance computing. First of all, <coughs> I want to explain why GRASS is particularly suitable to use for HPC processing. First of all, all the GRASS modules and the libraries, they have a very low memory footprint. They never load the whole data set into memory. They always only load that part into memory that is actually currently processed. So even if you work with a raster map that's a few 50 gigabytes or something like this large, the actual memory footprint can be as low as one megabyte, for example. That makes it particularly suitable to run, uh, to parallelize it um, heavily and run it on a high-performance computing system. Second, uh, GRASS is not a single application. 
you can rather regard it as a toolbox and GRASP provides a few hundred tools that can be used independently of each other or also as a processing environment. The example here is um, analysis of reconstruction of NDVI values uh, that's from MODIS. This I did globally uh, just to show an example in <laughs> South America and northern parts in the Amazon rainforest. There are lots of gaps and I want to fill them. Here I use um, harmonic analysis of time series, HUNTS just as an example. That's a sh short um, example for how this looks at in time from the uh, here on the lower right. So you see the gaps and you see one big outlier and that's the result what I want to get to. Um, so I want to reconstruct in space and in time. With this harmonic analysis of time series, the whole processing is actually done only in time, so I'm not doing any spatial interpolation or something like this. <coughs> so my understanding of high, perform of high performance computing, or as I have used it in this example, is I have a master node that can also be a compute node and any number of compute nodes. So compute nodes are facultative, can be zero compute nodes or thousand compute nodes, depending on what you have. The components then are, we have this master with a job or queue manager. Um, there are lots of different job and queue managers, uh, job schedulers out there. Therefore, I will not go into detail, just to mention a few common examples that you find on university clusters or something like this are Talk and Slurm. There are also talks on the other dev room session on HPC computing that go into more detail about this. Um, considerations when you're running um, grass on a high performance computing system are the actual hardware resources available for each compute node. This is needed to like tailor and design your workflow, how much load you can actually put on each compute node. Otherwise, um, you will get all sorts of problems. I'll come to these problems later on shortly. So the general idea here of parallelization is that we are running several GRASS commands or GRASS modules at the same time on the same compute node or on different compute nodes. Before we actually start, we need to create chunks for parallel processing. One option is to create temporal chunks, and the other option is to create uh, spatial chunks. That depends a little bit on if we are doing temporal processing or spatial processing. In the example here, you see these the solid arrows show the temporal slice that I want to process. Like I create two slices, one and two. And here I actually add a little bit of overlap to avoid spatial uh, temporal discontinuities. And the overlapping part of one I throw away, and the overlapping part of two I throw away of the dotted lines and only keep the solid lines to have a seamless um, reconstructed time stack. You can also create spatial chunks that has also been quickly mentioned previously with uh, GDAL, for example. You can create virtual raster data sets um, that are chopping up a large raster into tiles. Um, an important concept in GRASS here is the computational region, which is defined by the extents, north, south, west, and east, and the number of rows and columns. And considering, considering these, you can chop up a raster in any number of desired tiles. You can also create predefined regions. Instead of chopping up the raster physically, you simply predefine these computational regions. <coughs> so these, um, for spatial processing, um, that is when I want to do some spatial interpolation or freeing or something like this, um, I recommend to use each time step as one chunk for the parallel processing because the spatial chunks might suffer from spatial discontinuities which are very difficult to fix later on. Now, 
a little bit of the inner workings, um, how this high, uh, HPC workflow would work. First, I create a script with actual GRASS commands that do the actual processing within a given GRASS session. This um, I can run like by hand on a laptop just to figure out an optimized workflow. Then I create a second script that creates a unique GRASS session. Um, Marcus has mentioned this before. Um, this can also be done, for example, with the new Python interface, GRASS session. Here I prefer to do this manually, more or less manually, because I'm fine-tuning the settings a little bit for HPC processing. So this script number two is then actually running script number one. It's copying the results to a final destination and cleans up everything. Script number three is highly dependent on, may not exist at all, it depends on your job scheduler that you're using to manage the different jobs on your HPC system. The grass session is divided into two components. First, we have to set up the grass installation, some environmental variables, and also paths, like where are the grass libraries and the grass uh, executables, and so on. This is all done automatically on import. And then the actual session, which means we have to define where the spatial data are located. <coughs> A little bit more into the inner workings, but I won't go into too much detail. <laughs> so we have a special file called JSRC with the settings um, of the, uh, the grass session. And the most important component for HPC computing with grass is that we need temporary like environments, sandbox the whole computation so that the different compute nodes are not in, uh, interfering with each other. And in this case, it's a temporary map set that I'm creating. There, I do all the processing, and at the end, I copy everything back. Cleaning up can be as simple as rm minus rf, blah, that folder, gone, and done. More information is, of course, also on our wiki page about how to set up a grass session more or less automatically, or for batch processing, there's, um, there are also a few more examples. The important part of that job manager that we are using here is we must have a queue, something like this. So I designed, I started eight jobs. Four jobs are running. For the next four jobs, there are no hardware resources available, so they are in the queue, and they will start when the first four jobs are finished. Now comes the problem that we have experienced, or I have experienced in the past. So let's assume we have a number of jobs. They all do their processing independently. Finally, I want to keep all the results somewhere on a final destination. And every job is writing to a final destination storage. And this is the situation, the time when the whole system is going down and crashing. Um, yeah, so it depends on you can put HPC systems to the limits, and it depends on yeah, how they are set up. It's worth to try out their limits first. Another example, also what we did recently, is uh, land surface temperature processing. We have, in this case, a time series of about 30,000 maps, which we processed with HPC um, methods. And yeah, so essentially we want to get from gaps in space and time on the left-hand side to the fully reconstructed map on the right-hand side. And we want to do this 30,000 times in parallel, something like this. Most important when you do HPC processing, you need to have a good admin that fixes the system after you broke it. And just for clarification, I'm the one who's uh, breaking it. I'm not the one who's fixing it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your attention.
disk space. Yeah, disk space. I mean, uh, for products that we are making, it, uh, we might need over uh, 500 gigabytes. Maybe, maybe not. So disk space is usually fixed. The only solution is to uh, buy more disk space. <laughs> 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 yeah, no. It's easier to buy more memory. Um, so if you want one terabyte more disk space, this is easy to buy, but one terabyte of memory is a little bit more of a problem. Yeah. Another solution maybe is to run less jobs in parallel and then use some external storage where you have enough disk space for the final results. Then you can avoid the high disk consumption for intermediate <coughs> data. That, in yeah. the past we were running into the same system and the only solution was to reduce the amount of parallel jobs. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, yeah. Kind of. and then uh, you additionally have the possibility to tell where to store the temporary yeah. Uh, if you have some spare disk, which is maybe slower, but still can handle more space, you just tell it with an environmental variable, okay, uh, do it that way. Yeah. So I'm <coughs> actually never running using the HPC system on full power, like on full CPU power, because the bottleneck is reading and writing the data. Usually we do not create any temporary files, uh, but a workflow, more complicated workflow, like for land surface temperature reconstruction, consists not only of one single processing step, but of 15, 20 steps. And we have to monitor each step. <coughs> each step is producing output, which is then becoming input for the next step. Depending <coughs> on the processing, you cannot simply pipe it through memory to the next step because memory would <coughs> explode. And we also need sometimes to keep intermediate results in order to figure out what went wrong. If everything went fine, we simply delete with the power command rm minus rf everything and we have our displays back for the next job. Yes, so yeah, that's part of the optimization. Of course, you want, don't want to create too many intermediate products um, or intermediate data, but well, depending on the complexity of the workflow and for NDVI reconstruction, this is uh, straightforward. Actually, we do not have any intermediate data because this hunt procedure is immediately producing the final output. For land surface temperature, I have well, 30 inter intermediate products because the workflow is complicated. I have to check that the results are correct that I want to use as input for the next step. So this is, yeah. Yeah, we don't have any more questions. Or you can't hear. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>